What is up, Nets world? We're back here on the Believe in Nets podcast on the Believe Podcast Network. As always, I'm your host, Eric Slater, Brooklyn Nets beat reporter for ClutchPoints.com. Recording this at about 5 o'clock on a Thursday. Had a very special guest on the pod today, Frank Isola, Yes Studio Analyst for the Brooklyn Nets TV broadcast, also seen and heard on ESPN and Sirius XM NBA Radio. And we spoke about the Brooklyn Nets and where they're at and where they are at is not in a good place. It's been two games since the last time I potted both of those losses convincingly by double digits at New Orleans against the Pelicans and at Houston against the Rockets last night. The Nets have lost five straight, 10 of their last 12. They really aren't doing many things well on either end of the floor right now. Offensively, they're struggling big time. In my opinion, that's a product of their defensive inefficiencies, which for a team that came into the season with a supposed defensive identity, you know, Ben Simmons, all these wings, all these three and D guys, potential defensive player of the year candidate and Nick Claxton. The Nets have stunk on that end all year, to be quite frank. They're 26th in defensive rating over this last 12 game stretch in which they're two and 10. And that is forcing them to play in the half court offensively, nearly every possession, which is a problem. And we know it's a problem because earlier in the year, Jock Vaughn, talked about the Nets, and he said, we are not a team that wants to play in the half court. He went as far as admitting that. So the Nets being 26 in defensive rating, they are allowing the fourth highest effective field goal percentage in the NBA over these last 12 games. That's pretty much neutralized their transition games. I have the numbers here. Over the Nets' first 23 games, they were sixth in fast break points, eighth in opponents' fast break points. Over these last 12 games, they are 26th in fast break points, 27th in opponents' fast break points. And that's really hurt their identity and what they were trying to be offensively. And what that was was a three-point heavy team that was going to win the math game every night. And they have done a complete 180 and done the opposite of that over these last 12 games. They're allowing opponents to shoot 43% from three, that is the NBA's best percentage during that span. The Nets themselves are shooting 32.5% from three, that ranks 28th in the league. So they're allowing opponents to make 3.5 extra threes every game. That's a 10.5 difference each game. And that was the difference last night against the Houston Rockets, who made six more threes and were a plus 18. And despite the Nets playing well in the first half, they were not able to overcome that deficit. And the reason for that is they don't have enough offensive firepower. They have a guy like Mikhail Bridges, who was supposed to be their number one option this year, but has not lived up to those expectations over these last 12 games, really over the last three weeks to a month. Mikhail's averaging 16 points on 37, 29, 76 shooting splits. Spencer Dimwitty during that span, 12 points on 36, 27, 71 shooting splits. He hasn't been able to get going. And then you have a guy like Cam Thomas, who was moved to the bench for Brooklyn's last four games in favor of Dorian Finney-Smith because Jock Vaughn could no longer roll out the pairing of Thomas and Dinwiddie alongside one another because of their defensive limitations. He's struggling mightily since that move to the bench. His minutes have gone down from, I think, 30 minutes per game to 23 minutes per game, and he is 1-for-25 from the field over his last 10 quarters. He did not record a field goal in either game against New Orleans or Houston, and he's in a position right now where his role has been inconsistent. The Nets have kind of played a weird game with his development, rather prioritizing a guy like Spencer Dinwiddie, who was 30 years old and on an inspiring contract. I talked about that on my last pod. And bottom line is the Nets aren't doing many things well right now. They're in a tough place. They did not look like a team who was playing inspired basketball against New Orleans. They were a little bit better against Houston last night, but ultimately still a double-digit loss. So Going to break down everything that's going wrong there, as well as some larger overarching storylines approaching the de- the trade deadline in the interview with Frank Isola after the theme music. We've got a very special guest on the pod today, Yes Network studio, uh, studio analyst, also seen on ESPN's Around the Horn and Pardon the Eruption, as well as Sirius XM NBA Radio, Frank Isola. How you doing, my man? The rest for success, as you can tell. <laughs> you, you, you got me out of bed, so this is this is my uh, Sunday finest. Everything you, else you see on TV is all uh, makeup and good lighting. I was say, you you've been out of bed. That's a mouthful trying to get all your job titles in there. I was, I'm curious with all that you do with all those gigs, do you have one that's your favorite? (laughs) You're you're already trying to get me in trouble from the start. They're all different. (laughs) You know, doing the stuff at on PTI and around the horn is a ton of fun. The radio is easy because, you know, it's like you're doing 
a podcast. I do it for three hours. And Brian Scalabrini, who I do it with, the former Ned, who obviously does the television for NBC Sports Boston, he's very good. You know, as an ex-player, and he's far enough away from when he played where, you know, he has enough cynicism and enough humor and enough good stories where he's really good. And, I, you know, I love this, you know, doing the Nets stuff. I was a beat writer. One of my first jobs was covering the Nets back way back when for the New York Daily News. And then I became the Nick beat writer for a really long time. So I kind of I always like the rhythm of the beat and being around a team for a full season and just kind of seeing like the peaks and valleys. It's a little bit different when you're doing it on TV. But this year we've been doing the home games from the arena, the pre and post game on the S network and halftime as well. So it's a lot of fun because I get to also see a lot of coaches and just NBA people that I haven't seen in a while. I know you played soccer at Maryland. Also have a daughter who's a division one soccer player and now coach. I'm curious, where did uh, the basketball knowledge come from? Where did the desire to get into reporting and covering the NBA come from? Well, growing up, I was uh, a huge basketball fan. It's funny what you've seen in the last um, few years, might be the last few years, really last 15 to 20 years, just kind of the, you know, the connection between soccer, especially in Europe and the American players and the international players are all somewhat connected. I always think it's funny too. I think the really smart NBA players, and, you know, you look at, like you can go to the top of the list, guys like LeBron and obviously Kobe, when he played, you know, not only did they like the sport, but they also were probably a little blown away by how much the soccer guys make. <laughs> and I think they were, that's the connection there, but also the way that guys, you know, the, the two sports do have, a lot in common. And I appreciate you saying that I played at Maryland. I was, I was a walk on on the team. I did get into a couple of games, but I think they were probably just uh, doing charity work by letting me wear a, a uniform and giving me free cleats, which was a nice little perk. You, you have any time to watch soccer these days with all, all the other- time, the two sports that I watch all the time are basketball and soccer. And it's, you- it's easy too, because the, you know, the, the games in England or in Italy, wherever you're going to watch them, Spain, they're all on in the morning or the afternoon. So the, you know, the games, it never, it, there's never like a conflict where you say like, oh, I got to pick one or the other. You you could always watch them. And it's funny, you know, the Nets had the game last Wednesday against um, the Milwaukee Bucks on December 27th, I should say. And I think Gio Reyna was at the game. He's the big American player that plays over in Germany. And then uh, Vincius or Vinny Jr., as he's called, who's a big time Brazilian player who plays at Real Madrid. And you remember last year after the World Cup, Kylian Mbappe, uh, who plays for France, was in the finals. And then Hakimi, who played for Morocco. They made it to the semifinals of the World Cup. And he's Mbappe's teammate in Paris. They were at the game. So, you know, those worlds are a lot closer. I think the soccer guys obviously enjoy American basketball basketball more than they enjoy any other American sport. Yeah, I'm not a soccer guy. I'm a football guy. I played football. But I recently, I watched that Beckham documentary. Yeah, it was good. I'm not sure if you watched that, but she, I thought some fans in the United States were crazy and some of the, you know, journalists and reporting surrounding that, that would, that is just what that guy went through out there after the world cup. And after some of those things, just the roller coaster, the highs and lows of what he dealt with there. That's, that's really unbelievable. Yeah. And I think too, you know, that's him playing for his national team and it shows you how big it is to play for your national team and to mm-hmm. win on the international level. That's why I think, you know, I wish the the Olympics and I think the NBA would have to be involved, but I think the FIBA World Cup should be the premier event. It is for every other country in the world. Now, maybe not Canada, but for all the other countries, the European countries, the Asian countries, African countries, South America, the big tournament to win is the FIBA World Cup. It's not the Olympics because the Olympics, it's there's less teams that are in it. I think for you know, you know, the US. We all grew up watching the Olympics and we think the Olympic gold medal, which obviously is a great thing, but really the more prestigious thing should be winning the FIBA World Cup. That's why I think they should do, you know, soccer, what they do for the um, Olympics, it's U23, and then you're allowed two wildcard players. Now, you Mm -hmm. could probably come up with that same system for the Olympics where, you know, obviously the Americans would have enough players. I mean, a lot of countries would. You, You have a team of U23 or younger and then two wildcard players. I think I think it would make the competition better and then this way the big players would all go to the FIBA World Cup all right let's get into the Nets the Nets are obviously in one of the rougher stretches that you're going to see they're two and ten over their last 12 games 27th in offense and 26th in defense during that span we got some news today actually not more bad news for the Nets they're fined a hundred thousand dollars for violating the league's player participation policy December 27th during a loss to the Milwaukee Bucks Backstory there, they just they rested Spencer Dimwitty, Cam Johnson, Nick Claxton, Dorian Finney-Smith. 
Then they effectively rested Mikhail Bridges, Cam Thomas, and Royce O'Neal. Also, those guys didn't play after the first quarter, despite it being a two-point game midway through the third quarter. Third quarter, those guys didn't re-enter the game. Even guys like De'Aaron Sharp, Dennis Smith Jr., Trenton Wofford didn't play in the fourth quarter. It was honestly incredible how committed the Nets were to punting this game for a team that's not, you know, successful right now and factoring into the contention conversation. Just curious your thoughts on that whole debacle. Yeah, a couple of things, Eric. And also, let's remember the opponent they were facing. Not only is it a championship contender, which why the competitor in you wants to measure yourself up against some of the best teams. Only Look at what Indiana has done in the five games that they've played the Milwaukee Bucks. They've already beaten them four times. It's turned into a real good rivalry. You know, on a Wednesday night, they scored 142 points against them. And the Milwaukee Bucks on the road, when they came into Brooklyn, were 6-6. Six and six. They give up a ton of points. They lost to Chicago and Toronto on the road. So it wasn't like you were playing the 85 Celtics when they rolled into town. And you're thinking, we have no chance of winning. I don't. I never understood any of it. You know, you want to rest some guys, that's one thing. But, you know, I was looking at social media, you know, early in the day when the, you know, I think you had the status report of all the players. And if you looked at a lot of the comments, a lot of net fans were joking around, oh, Cam Thomas is going to get 60 points. Cam Thomas will get 50. Why not run Cam Thomas? Uh, uh, Royce O'Neal out there, Dayron Sharp. Those guys are competitive players. They'll compete, you know, for as long as they're out there. Now, Dayron Sharp probably would have fouled out in about twenty to twenty-five minutes, but at least you know there there does reach a point where it is entertainment, and people are paying to go to the game now. I think a lot of people paid to go see Giannis, obviously, but they want to see the Nets compete against them. And I could speak from a member of the media and also a consumer because I bought three tickets for that game. I had my wife and kids at the game. It cost me an arm and a leg to buy three tickets. And it's a little disappointing when something like that happens. You could see why it's a turnoff. I don't understand it. it. To me, it never made any sense. And look at what's happened since then. You know, once you try to mess with the game and you know, the basketball gods, they end up losing on the either two days later at Washington. Then they lost every game on the road trip. I never thought it made any sense. I think it's backfired. I think the spirit of the team, and you tell me, I mean, you're watching as well. I think the whole vibe of the team, just doesn't look good after what happened that that Wednesday night at Barclays Center. It's interesting because, you know, Jock Vaughn had some comments after their loss in New Orleans on Tuesday, and he was talking about the team needing to play with more desperation, needing to get on the floor, you know, do all these things given where they're at. And it's like those comments lose a little bit of luster when you punted on a game a week ago. <laughs> uh, you're, 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 you're 100% right. I, I was thinking the same exact thing. And it's like you you get it, but also at the same time, you don't get it why they did something like that. And if you're 20 and 15, let's say, or at the time when they did it, let's say they were 15 and 11 and you're the Boston Celtics and you know Tatum, Brown, you've been, you went had a bunch of long playoff runs and you're thinking, you know what, it, it, no one's going to like it, but let's just give these guys the night off because we have a long stretch of games. You know that they're going to be okay. You're the Brooklyn Nets. You went into the game hovering around 500. I don't know how you could decide to give up on any game. And it's funny you mentioned the New Orleans game because I was thinking the same thing you did. And then last night, you know, the Nets are going to be home for two games and then they're going to go to Paris and then they go out to the West Coast. And Jacques Vaughn was asked about being back at Barclays. And he was talking about all the excitement, the energy the crowd brings. I'm thinking, well, hang on a second. The last time you played a home game, nobody played. Now we should be looking forward. Now you guys are looking forward to be getting back to Barclays Center. That all the messaging was so off and it just it it's just a bad look all the way around and what i was confused more so like i wasn't surprised that the nets might try to rest some get guys in that game because they did the same thing last year in a game against indiana that they actually miraculously pulled yeah, out i remember that that's right but um the way that's that also they, on the road that's also on the road yeah here. on the road yeah there's something to be said about being at home but there's also something to be said about jock Vaughn was asked about it post game about the decision to not bring back in guys like thomas Mikhail Bridges, O'Neal after the first quarter. And he gave an answer of like, we ran those guys 40 minutes the prior night in Detroit. I didn't want to get up there. It's like, I get that with Bridges, but then you look at Thomas and O'Neal. Thomas played 23 minutes against Detroit. O'Neal played 15 minutes. Thomas, the guy's 22 years old. He probably wants to play as much as possible. Even like Sharp and Smith Jr. didn't play a lot. So the decision when the game is a two point game midway through the third quarter to not bring those guys back in, I found extremely interesting. And also a part of this I don't like is that, you know, Jock Vaughn's up there and he's getting hammered for this and he might've played a role in the decision-making process. Right. But to say that this is just a Jock Vaughn decision, yeah, you're right. organizational decisions that go far past the head coach. So, you know, Jock's getting hammered by Nets fans right now. And I'm not going to say right. that that's wrong, but 
to leave him up there is kind of hanging him out to dry. And that's something that I really didn't appreciate about the situation. Yeah. I, I, I think that's absolutely um, a fair point. And again, you know, you, you take in the court that night and the idea is to give yourself the best chance to win. If you remember the question from Zach from the New York post, and I think, you know, Jock got caught up on the thing about calling it an exhibition, but my mm -hmm. thing would have been, do you, do you feel like you gave your team the best chance to win? last night with the, or the, on that night with the lineup that you had out there. I don't know how you could say yes to something like that. And that's not to say that the guys weren't out there competing and Jock Vaughn wasn't coaching his heart out on the sideline, but I, I, I just don't get it. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. So when I was covering the Knicks, they had a guy, this goes back to what you said about Cam Thomas, how old he is and you know wanting to be out there and playing. Nate Robinson was um, a rookie on the Knicks and Nate, you know, the guy was bouncing off the wall. The guy was a freak of an athlete. He played, you know, uh, college football. His father played at Washington, played in the Rose Bowl, in fact. I think it was Jock Robinson was his name. But um, Nate loved playing basketball. And he wasn't playing a lot, obviously, his rookie year. And the story was that one day he was driving down the street uh, and drove past the courts at West 4th Street. Guys were playing. He got parked, got out of his car, and started playing pickup basketball with a bunch of guys on, the, on concrete in New York City. My point is that guys like that can play all the time. Cam Thomas could Cam Thomas, I guarantee you, was thinking that day when he woke up and heard it wasn't going to play. He was probably thinking, I'm going to play 40 minutes and I'm going to score 50 points in this game and we're going to win the game. I get and you know what? There's nothing wrong with him thinking like that because I, I think this year he's had moments where he's been the best player. I said the other night on the S Network, I think he's been their best player. Then he hasn't made a shot since then. <laughs> but you know, he looked, he does look a little demoralized but that game was tailor-made for him and if he had played let's say he had played 40 minutes in that game and he scored between 40 and 50 points i don't think the fans i don't think the the fans would be as bitter about everything that went down the idea of sitting those guys that you mentioned after they played in the first quarter i didn't understand that at all well, this is what you do you know you talk about the nba for a living so i'm curious and it sounds like based on how you're answering that i could guess your viewpoint but you know, this load management conversation, it's obviously something that the NBA is trying to crack down on somewhat with this player participation policy. But, you know, in your eyes, does this reflect more just this trend over the last five or so years? Does this reflect more on the players or on the league and scheduling and things along those lines? Yeah, and I also think the agents play a factor in it, too, because I think now when guys enter the league, you know, when I first started covering, I don't think guys entered the league and thinking, I'm going to spend 20 years in the NBA and I'm going to try to make every dime I can. I think guys just went at it full speed all the time and like, you know, let the cards fall where they may. I think guys come in now thinking if I could play 15 years, I might be able to get like two or three max contracts. So I think there's a little bit of that. I think the agents put that in their heads, but I think one way to, there are a couple ways to fix it. You could short, you could just shorten the season. That's always, but they won't do that because that would mean less money for everybody. Yep. So you want, you want to have all these games. You want the fans to go to these games, but not all the, the star players are going to show up. I've been saying this for a few years now. And they do this, I'll go back to soccer. You know, if they play multiple games in a week, there are some guys, star players, especially the strikers up top, who there's a lot of physical demands, maybe a midfielder, where they'll sit the first 60 minutes of a game and they'll play the last 30. I don't understand why you can't have certain players. You just tell them, listen, I don't care when you show up at the arena, just be ready to play at the start of the second half. And we're going to play you minimum of 18 minutes, but guys don't do that because everything is based on average. If everything was based on total points, total rebounds, assist steals, I think guys might have a different mindset when it comes to doing something like that, knowing that they're only going to play a few minutes. So you could have kind of balanced it out that night and maybe played a few of the guys in the first half and saved a couple of guys for the second half. And then depending on how the game went, maybe you play them shorter or a little bit longer. I think there is there are ways to solve it. You, you cannot tell me that an NBA player, if you told him, think about it now, the game's a 7.30 game, and the second half is going to start by what, like 8.45? You mean to tell me a guy who has all day to rest and knows he's just playing 18 minutes, it's really that taxing on their body? I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. All right, getting away from that conversation and more into the team's recent struggles over this 12-game stretch, as I said, 27th in offense, 26th in defense, really haven't been able to do many things well, and those two wins have come came against the Detroit Pistons, so that's not saying much. What has been the most surprising thing about you? You know, you follow this team, and you're in the, in the booth analyzing. What has been most surprising about these struggles? 
Well, I think, you know, def- defensively, that's been a big part of it. But I also think, you know, who's the leader on the team? You know, who's the guy that has a resume? The one guy that has been an all-star and that does have something of a resume is Ben Simmons, and he never plays. So remove that from the equation. So the guy that you're looking for to be the guy is Mikel Bridges, and that's tough. He's still a young player, number one. I understand that he's been to a finals, but, you know, when he was in Phoenix, he clearly was behind Devin Booker and Chris Paul. You could probably make the case he was behind DeAndre Ayton. So you go from being either the third or the fourth guy on a team where now they're looking for you every single night, and it doesn't mean you have to score 35 points a game or even 30 points a game. But, you know, you, you do have to deliver – a lot on both ends of the court. And I think that's what they're missing. I, you know, you look at the NBA, start going down everybody's roster. If you look at the, you know, the best team in the league right now, the Boston Celtics, look at the talent they have. Look at Minnesota. You know, Carl Anthony Towns has been an all-star. Anthony Edwards is a big-time player. You know, Shea Gildas Alexander. The Nets just don't have that guy. And in the NBA, it doesn't mean that you can't win. I mean, the Pistons won without having like an MVP type of player. Now they did have all stars with Chauncey Billups for Hamilton, uh, obviously Rashid Wallace, Ben Wallace. The Knicks kind of have that a little bit with what they have now with Jalen Brunson, OG Ananobi, and Julius Randle. The Nets have to get that. If you if you don't have a superstar, it's hard to win. And the team that they had a few years ago that made it to the second round, would they win six of their first seven playoff games? That was a great that team was the best team in the NBA that year. They just got a little unlucky in the playoffs. But what did they have? They had Kevin Durant MVP. They had um, James Harden, a former MVP, and Kyrie Irving, who hit the biggest shot in the history of the Cleveland Cavalier franchise. The Nets just don't have that kind of talent right now, or that kind of experience, or that kind of leadership. It's no secret that the Nets didn't have a star player entering the season. That was a large part of the conversation. But what they do have, and what's interesting about the team, in my opinion, is they have a lot of capable players. You yes. Know, eight, nine, ten deep, incapable players, mostly veterans. And with that is kind of brought about an interesting conversation of them not having an established pecking order. You know, all these other teams have either star players or they have guys that they know they're going to. The Nets don't have that right now. Like we thought it was going to be Mikhail Bridges and could he make a star leap? And during this 12 game stretch, he's averaging 16 points a game on 37 percent shooting. So he's really struggling in that role now. And 50 games before that, he was around 24 on 50, 40, 90. But That brings in an interesting conversation of him not really being a high usage ball handler type guy anyway. And then you look down the rest of the roster, Spencer Dinwiddie's also struggling this last 12 games. He's at 12 points per game on 36% shooting. Cam Thomas is being yo-yoed between the starting lineup and bench. And he's having these struggles. Like we said, he's one for 25 from the field over his last 10 quarters. So it gets to an interesting conversation of when these other teams go on runs Who's going to step up? Like you watched that game last night against. I Houston. agree. Alperin Sengun is is dominating them in the second half, and it's like guys like Mikhail Bridges, Spencer Dimwitty, Cam Thomas are nowhere to be found. And you know, I want to talk about Bridges a little bit. You know, I don't think his offensive struggles are the the extent to which he's struggling is surprising, but it's not surprising that he's regressing a little bit because I never had any illusions of him being a number one or even a number two offensive guy in a championship team. But the Nets' defense has been terrible this season yeah. they're a team that were supposed to come in the year with the defensive identity and to be quite frank mikhail bridges to be quite frank yeah i got you on here Thank this, you. Uh, mikhail bridges he hasn't been very good on defense this season in my opinion and this is a guy that a lot of people talked about as a defensive player of the year candidate and that the eye test matched that if you watched him with the suns but it's taken a step back and particularly during this 12 game stretch he's really been a negative on that end so I'm just curious about what you've seen from the Nets defense. And has that surprised you, the minimal impact that Mikhail Bridges has been able to have? Yeah, so I had an NBA assistant coach at one of these games say that they were surprised at how much he slipped defensively. And, you know, the the one thing about Mikhail Bridges, again, he's a terrific player, but, you know, it's hard to be that guy every night. And there's a reason why these superstar players get paid a ton of money, whether they're just big-time offensive players where they're big time two way players, and they're, you know, they, they don't come a dime a dozen. They just don't. And I think for Mikel Bridges, I think he's a young player, and I think he has struggled a little bit with the spotlight now being on him. You know, when you're playing out in Phoenix, it's a bit of a country club atmosphere out there to begin with. He was, you know, again in the pecking order, at least three, maybe even four. And now when you're, you're, you have to be that guy every night, and who's kind of that veteran to guide him? You know, if they had an all-star player at at point guard, and maybe that could be Ben Simmons if if he were healthy, 
maybe that would help a guy like Mikel Bridges. And I just, I just think trying to navigate it on your own, and you know this happens too, Eric. Now that he's more in the spotlight, you know, does, is he reading stuff that's on social media? Is he listening to stuff that people are saying on television? How is that impacting him? When you're, even though you went to the finals with the Phoenix Suns, you're kind of floating under the radar when you're the third or fourth best guy. And, you know, a lot was made about DeAndre Ayton as the number one overall pick, uh, Booker's a star, and then Chris Paul's always a lightning rod and a Hall of Fame player. So you don't, you're not really the guy that they're focused on. Now you're playing in Brooklyn. Teams are going to game plan for you. When you don't succeed, you know, he's been uh, criticized a lot. I think uh, and there's one thing that he's been doing. He's been really late coming to, like, talking to the media after games. Like, does he want to be the spokesman of the team? I kind of feel like he should be. After, like, tough losses, I'd like to see, like, him. I'd like to see the coach out there and then Mikhail Bridges be the next guy. And I, I don't know, like, it, it's not it's not easy just to say he's our guy. He's the face of our franchise, especially for a guy, again, with who's inexperienced and is pretty young still as well. And then you look at the Nets who have that kind of upside and have the talent to kind of give you some eye-popping numbers, really bring some stability on particularly the offensive end of the floor in this player's case. And one of those guys is Cam Thomas, and his role has been in flux his entire time in Brooklyn for three yeah. seasons. This year, he pretty much forces his way into the starting lineup with a performance in the first game of the season. Then there's some injuries. Then he injures his ankle. He's out for nine games. He comes back, doesn't start the first game back. Then he's put back into the starting lineup for nine games. And then that starting unit is terrible. And that's largely because Cam Thomas and Spencer Dinwiddie playing alongside each other, two guys that are glaring defensive negatives for a team that was supposed to have a def defensive identity entering the year, and now he's moved back to the bench in favor of Dorian Finney-Smith, and he's in this rut. Did that move back to the bench surprise you in Cam Thomas's case, and how do you feel just about the overall handling of him as a young player with the Nets? I think it was the easy move to make because if you're going to put Spencer Dinwiddie on the bench, he's a veteran player. How would he react to something like that? You know, you know, would that impact the Nets if they're looking to trade him? You know, Cam Thomas has been on the team for a few years now. I would have kept him in the starting lineup. The guy, he is a special scorer. When he gets on a roll, I mean, the Nets don't have anybody like that. And you, know, you look at what happened in New Orleans the other night, he was a big factor of it. He was over 11. But I think his confidence has been hit a little bit. I think he's sulking a bit since he went back to the bench. I, I think it's backfired. I, if you watch the way that he played and you see every game, it wasn't just Cam Thomas, get me the ball, everybody get out of my way, I'm going to take a crazy shot. I thought he was trying to create plays for his teammates. He just wasn't taking the first shot that he would see. Now, there would be times when you'd shake your head a little bit, but he's he also has the ability to make tough shots. Considering his age, he's a guy that the team drafted. You know that he, he, know that he has a skill for the NBA. He could score, and he could score pretty um, you know, proficiently, maybe not always efficiently. But I, I would have kept him in there because I think he's that good of a player. I've actually I've always been a little down on him. This year I've been higher on him because I just think I feel like he's starting to get it a little bit on the offensive end. He's always going to be weak defensively, but Eric, everybody has a weakness, but not everyone could score like Cam Thomas. I, I've had it's been interesting following Cam Thomas, especially this season, because the conversation obviously it was glaring that him and Dim Woody were not working as a pairing in that starting lineup. Yeah. So Vaughn was put in a position where he had to make the decision between those two. Jock Vaughn spoken to me and to others this year about how he's more analytically focused now than he has been ever in his career. And, you know, I'm somebody who likes to look at the advanced numbers and just know what's going on there. And the numbers really favored Spencer Dimwitty in terms of his ability to facilitate the ball, even some of the defensive numbers. So I wasn't surprised that Cam moved to the bench, but it gets to a conversation with the Nets of a team that's not in title contention and frankly, not even close to that right now of a player who's 22 years old, as you said, the name of the game in the NBA is putting the ball in the basket. He's proven he can do that with the best of them for stretches. And you have a guy like that, and you're really playing with his role, and you're kind of putting him in flux into different situations. And you know, this season before the move to the bench, he was averaging 23 points on 45, 37, 85 shooting splits. And the number that's most important to me is he was playing 30 minutes a game. Four games since that move to the bench, and obviously these zero point games, the last two games, you know, break this up. But he's averaging 10 points per game on 25 percent shooting, but he's only playing 21 minutes per game. Yeah. So the playing time is really what 
you know, is a little concerning to me because the move to the bench, I didn't like it. But if he's still going to maintain that role, this is a guy that the net should be prioritizing his development, in my opinion. And you're playing him 21 minutes per game. You're, you know, benching him down the fourth quarter of certain matchups. His role is really conditional. And that's a difficult situation when that stuff isn't even resulting in winning. The guys that are playing in place of him, like Spencer Dinwiddie and some of these guys, aren't producing at anywhere near a level to warrant that. So do you think that this is something that could be reevaluated by them as the season goes on? Do you think this says more about them trying to remain competitive? Well, that's why between now and the trade deadline, you know, the, the, maybe the Nets are still trying to sort things out and maybe they're playing guys as a way to showcase them. But the whole Cam Thomas thing, it also it still it goes back to the Milwaukee game. Why didn't he play that game? Why Why wouldn't that be the game where you say just throw him out there for 40 minutes and let him let him carry us, let him do what he does and let the Milwaukee Bucks try to figure out because the Milwaukee Bucks can't guard anybody. So maybe it would have been him against Damian Lillard. They, they could have uh, had all different kind of matchups. So that, that, could, that could have worked out. I think that, you know, you look at what happened with the Houston Rockets the other night. You know, so they got a lot of young players on the team, Jabari Smith and Jalen Green. They're out there playing all the time. And I understand that they were drafted higher than Cam Thomas was, it, but they made a commitment to those guys. But they also have Fred Van Vliet out there, a veteran player that was a, an important part of a team that won a championship, and obviously the young big man in Shangoon who's done really well. I just don't I, – I, when, I, when I watch the things that have happened – over the past week, especially as it relates to Cam Thomas, I, I don't really get it. I mean, you, you're losing games as it is. Why not make a commitment to him? He's, you know, the, the guys that I would make a commitment to are Claxton, um, Dayron Sharp, who let's face it, has played really well this year. He's made a, he's made a big jump and also Cam Thomas. And, you know, it's interesting with Thomas because when you talk about development, you know, there's been there are some holes in his game. And as we said, we know defensively, one of the holes offensively is playmaking. And I posted this number a few times throughout the last week, but he has the highest usage percentage on the Nets by far. He's getting the ball a good amount. He actually has the same usage this season as Jalen Brunson with the Knicks. So that tells yeah. you a lot about how much he has the ball. And his assist to usage ratios are pretty much how often he's getting assists versus how often he has the ball. Among players at his position, he's dead last in the NBA. So that was a little concerning, and I thought that that spoke yeah. to Jock Vaughn's decision to have Spencer Dinwiddie in the lineup, trying to have a little bit of a stabilizer in there. But Spencer Dinwiddie is not playing well during this stretch. You know, he's yeah. he's struggling, and to be, you know, honestly, he's had some comments early in the year of a guy who could be, you know, question where am I after this season? Where am I going with this team? He talked about the Nets' core earlier in the year and he named about every other guy on the team for himself and said, the future's bright here. And it's like, I, he's not in that conversation in his own mind. So it's like, what, are, what are we trying to do here? If you're the nets, are, are you prioritizing a guy like Spencer Dimwitty who maybe doesn't even see himself in the immediate future plans over yeah. a guy like 22 can Thomas, who while has some deficiencies could be improving in that area of his game. And when you're talking about it from the basketball, you know, schematic standpoint, the play, the Nets have like six lineups this year with Thomas that have played 30 or more minutes or 30 lineups with Thomas that have played 30 or more minutes, something like that. Only five of them have positive net ratings. All yeah. of those lineups are with Spencer Dinwiddie off the floor and Ben Simmons or Dennis Smith Jr. on the floor. Yeah, and That's not surprising because, you know, I think the guy that Cam Thomas, if the Nets are going to prioritize him, they need a guy next to him who can obviously defend at point guard, yep. need a guy who can handle the ball and be able to set him up. And right now the Nets really don't have that. So it's put them in a in a position of do we try to force Thomas to develop in some of those areas on his own and put him on a little bit of an Island at point guard, or do we scale his rollback and lean more into Spencer Dinwiddie? The answer has been Dinwiddie right now. And to me, that's a little bit of a signal of the direction that they're going in of trying to stay competitive. And there's obviously a lot of factors moving into that. So, you know, yeah. that's, that's a little bit of the conversation, you know, we're approaching the trade deadline, Wanted to get your opinions on where the Nets are at big picture, because as I just said, you know, I think these smaller situations during the season might say a little bit about the direction they're trying to head in. You know, what kind of if you evaluate the Nets, does this recent stretch, where do you expect them to be coming into the season? And does this recent cold stretch change those expectations? I mean, I, I thought they would be anywhere from six to 11. So, you know, they, they certainly are good enough to be in the play in tournament, but I expected probably a little bit more. Adam McKell Bridges, I thought that Spencer Dinwiddie would play a little bit better. You know, obviously, you, know, you you've heard Sean Mark said you've had you've run the quote a couple of times. You know, at the start of the season, they're always evaluating. They're obviously big game hunting. They're going to be in a position at some point to make a trade. They're just waiting to see 
who's going to be available. I know a lot of people have talked about Donovan Mitchell. I was in Cleveland before the season. Now, Donovan Mitchell is obviously going to say all the right things, but, you know, the uh, Kobe Altman, the general manager, said, you know, because he's under contract through next season, there's no rush for them to do anything. So I think if a guy like Donovan Mitchell becomes available, I don't think it'll be until the summer. But the Nets are going to have some uh, big decisions to make because, you know, Right now, the Houston Rockets have their first round pick They're So, you know, finishing with a uh, a poor record isn't going to help the Brooklyn Nets. So they're obviously still trying to win. But I have a funny feeling the way things have gone over the past couple of weeks. And, you know, they have a lot of uh, tradable assets as, you know, players with expiring contracts. I think they're going to be pretty active uh, by the trade deadline. That doesn't mean they're going to trade four guys. But, you know, you could certainly see one or two guys perhaps on the move. Yeah, I guess it's pretty interesting with them because they're in a situation where they have some veteran guys who should have some trade value. They're trying to stay competitive. It seems like, as you said, might be going big game hunting. So kind of using this season as a little bit of an audition period, saying which guys trying to decide which guys are we going to keep here in the long term. And you brought up Donovan Mitchell. And I, I, I think the Donovan Mitchell conversation is so interesting because there's a lot of, there's a this whole faction of Nets fans on Nets Twitter. I don't know if you follow it, who you know, are very against not trading for Donovan Mitchell. And I think that that's, you know, it's interesting because I think they're taking a view of we've gotten burned by star trades before, you know, we're not looking good right now. Where is that going to get us? But to me, it's like, have you watched this team try to generate offense these last yeah. three games? It's like, as it, just from a fan's perspective, it's, it's so interesting to me that there is this large group of fans that don't want the Nets to make a move like that. When Frank, like right now, just from a watch perspective, these last few games have been brutal. I mean, like watching these games and watching them try to generate offense, trying to stop anybody. It's like, there's just nothing really exciting about the team right now. And even when that's, it extends to Cam Thomas, because he's supposed to be the youngest, most exciting guy on the team and they're not even playing him. So it's like, yeah, it's just... no, and, and uh, yeah, you're right. And Donovan Mitchell is a big game. And remember, we just passed the anniversary of Donovan Mitchell scoring 71 points. That was an overtime game and it, he it probably never should have gotten overtime because he left the lane early like he did against the Brooklyn Nets a couple of times last year. But if you go back to opening night, right, and Donovan Mitchell wasn't having a great game, but in the moment of cru uh, truth, winning time, as I like to call it, he made every huge play. I'm still trying to figure out why Cam Thomas backed off or flopped on that play when uh, when Donovan Mitchell hit the shot. And the Nets, remember with their offense, there was one play, wasn't it, um, Mikael Bridges, who who fell, and then they, yeah. they got bailed out on the foul call by Donovan Mitchell. And then you had Cam Thomas took that crazy shot at the end. Like Donovan Mitchell is a big time player in this league. I know he's not six foot four. You know, he's you know, he's deceivingly small. Maybe that number has something to do with it. Everybody sees that number 45 and they think automatically oh, think he's six foot six. Yeah. That's not the case. But that guy is a big time, big time player. Hey, if the Knicks could, you don't think they they, they would want um uh, Donovan Mitchell on their team, a guy that could take over games. So I, I think that he would be a big time priority for the Brooklyn Nets. And there's obviously a connection there. He's from this area. And I heard that he's really good friends with Mikel Bridges. I don't know what that means. If Mikel, I don't, you know, I'm sure the Nets would try to keep Mikel Bridges out of a trade. That's why it was interesting. What did you make of Adrian Wojnarowski reporting? You know, when he was asked about, it, he said that the Nets are still looking to build around Mikel Bridges, which is interesting. You're trying to build around a guy that's not really. That's not a number one guy and maybe not even a number two guy. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't surprised at, by that at all because there's, you know, there's this whole brigade of people that right now, you know, fans are upset. It's fire Jock Vaughn, fire Sean Marks, trade everybody, trade Mikhail Bridges. And it's like, you look at Mikhail Bridges, he's a guy who's 27 years old, but most importantly, he has two years left on his contract yeah. after this season. So unless the Nets were adamant that his trade value right now is higher than it's going to be you know, incrementally higher than it's going to be during those next two years. There's really no reason to move him right now. They're, they're, they're not in any rush in that regard. So I wasn't surprised by that in regards to them building around him. I don't think that they have any illusions that he's going to be a number one guy. And I think that some fans are even discounting getting a guy like Donovan Mitchell and what that does in terms of allowing Mikhail Bridges to slide back into a role that he's more comfortable in and being able to play yeah. off a guy like that. And then the Donovan Mitchell conversation gets all into, you know, how much are they giving up? People have asked me nonstop since some of these rumors started, how do you feel about it? And to me, it's like anything, it depends on the price. I mean, if the Nets are giving up, their premium picks, which are those 27, 2029 20, unprotected Phoenix picks. If I were the Nets, I wouldn't try to touch those. And I think there's a conversation of, you know, in regards to that move, which I fully also don't expect to happen until the summer. 
But, you know, honestly, if I were the Cleveland Cavaliers, I think they'd be smart to start fielding offers right now, but they won't. Um, but I, you know, it's interesting. The Nets have a lot of guys entering this trade deadline who are going to have value. So people are saying, we don't want to trade those Phoenix. We don't want to trade that 2029 Dallas picks, our own picks. Well, you have guys like Nick Claxton, Dorian Finney-Smith, Royce O'Neal. You obviously have a guy like Cam Thomas and Cam Johnson as centerpieces, but those other guys can be moved at the deadline. And then you have all these extra picks that you can be using in that deal to, you know, kind of like the move can have a larger scope than I think people are really recognizing. And, you know, Nick Claxton's a guy that I, I find really interesting and I want to talk about because defensive player of the year candidate supposedly last season coming into this year, I asked him at media day, you know, how do you feel about the all defense conversation? You being left out of that. He said, it makes my blood boil was the quote that he used. And the Nets now have, as I said, one of the worst defenses in the league, right? Yeah. Now, despite that. And I'm not putting that all on Claxton. I think that there's a big schematic conversation, but this also extends to Jock Vaughn, a guy who's supposed to be a defensive guy, yet the Nets are this bad with all these personnel, all these three and D wings that anchor like Nick Claxton. Just what have you made on that end? And how much as a team has that surprised you this year that they've been that poor? And, you know, Nick Claxton, you know, he could obviously, you know, run the court. He's terrific. He, you know, diving to the basket, but defensively, and he's, you know, really good at contesting shots, help defense. But look what happened when he went up against Shangun. Shangun can't jump over the Sunday newspaper, but he's crafty around the basket. But really, what he was dislodging Claxton a lot, because Claxton really, you know, is the size of a power forward in terms of his weight. So, so that is a major issue. And, you know, the, and you, you talk about the defensive player of the year stuff, you know, the game last night, you know, you you, had, you tweeted about it where you know Jock Vaughn said they had they were double teaming Shane Goon a lot. Well, if you have a, an all defensive player, well, why why would you double team? That's one thing. And then I still go back to that Milwaukee game too. I mean, if I'm if I'm Nick Claxton, I want to be defensive player of the year. I want to go up against Giannis and Tedekumbo. I, mean, I, I know he's not going to guard him the entire game, but th those are the kind of you know matchups that you want. Claxton, you know, Brian Scalabria on my radio show, I think, was talking about it. He mentioned Oklahoma City as a perfect place for Nick Claxton. Now, think about it. OKC has a lot of those first-round draft picks, number one. Maybe you can get a player back because, you know, they do need a little bit more size. And Oklahoma City right now is the second-best team, uh, you know, in the Western Conference. They'll be in Brooklyn on Friday. You know Sam Presti and Sean Marks have a relationship. All those San Antonio, San Antonio Spurs guys, they're, you know, they're as thick as thieves. It might not be the craziest thing if you can get uh, something out of Oklahoma City if they're not committed to giving Nick Claxton a long-term contract. Yeah, and when you're talking about Nick Claxton's long-term contract, it's an interesting conversation. I expected him to be a guy that would get somewhere from 20 to $25 billion a year because – and that's not even, you know, he played great last season, and that was really my take early in the season. But you look at some of the other center contracts, guys like Jakob Podol getting, you know, around $20 million. Yeah. You know, other, Yusef Nurkic makes $17 million. You know, Vucevic in Chicago gets $20 million, All that, although that might say more about their decision-making. But, you know, it's just the market is where it's around. But you talk about Nick Claxton, and the Nets have switched their defensive scheme this year to – you know, try to help with their rebounding, which they rank 29th in the NBA in rebounding. They've gone to more of a drop coverage this year. And I think that's indirectly really hurt Nick Claxton because it's neutralized what was his biggest strength. When you look yep. at what he did last year, that really made him so impressive is he was switching onto guards, guys yep. like Luka Doncic, like Jalen Brunson, and he was holding up on the perimeter against guys of that caliber. Now you have him in the drop coverage and that's no longer, you know, a skill that you're bringing to the table. And it's it's just getting it's getting really tough with this Nets defense because I understand the aim. They wanted to improve their rebounding, which they've done. They've gone from around 29th to around like 14th or 15th, I think they're at now. But defensively, they give up threes all over. Uh, the I was I was just day. about to say that. How how many of them are open threes? They I actually did on my last podcast, I talked about that during the recent, I think it was like over their last 12 or 13 games. And there you can actually look that up, like defender tracking distance. And they were ranking, they were giving up like the third or fourth most wide open threes in the league during that span. And it matches the eye test. And what they're doing is, you know, they're going to Nick Claxton in that drop coverage. And even with that, they're really digging down on some of these pick and rolls and some of these drives, and they're giving up all these open threes. And this is a Nets team that's identity early in the season. And the reason they were winning was built around winning that math game at the three point line. And they yeah. haven't been able to do it. And you talk about guys like Mikhail Bridges and Cam Thomas and Spencer Dinwiddie struggling and they need to play better. The Nets wanted to run this year. That's what they wanted to do. I mean, like Jock Vaughn has said it. 
pretty much flat out, like we don't want to play in the half court. You look yeah. at them over these last 12 games, they're playing in the half court nearly every possession. You, you, well, you want to know why? First of all, running is hard. It's easy to say that fans always, well, we should run. We should run. Well, it's, you, you it's go not easy to do. Number one, you've got to get stops mm. and then you got to get rebounds. But guys have to be, you know, willing to do that. It is not easy. It's always like the, the idiot's guy to, uh, you know, winning basketball. Let's just run. Well, it's, it's, that's not how it works. I mean, even like if you look at, one of the greatest fast break teams in the history of the sport, the Showtime Lakers, how good were they in the half court? They used to magic. A lot of times would walk it up. They'd wait for Kareem to cross mid court. Kareem would go post up magic would throw a bounce pass and Kareem would hit a sky hook. That's yeah. how they still were winning games. I mean, I get it. It's like, you know, on the highlights, it was magic, you know, passing to worthy or Byron Scott or Michael Cooper filling the lane. It looks great. That makes the highlights, but you're still winning a lot of times in the half court. But, you know, their philosophy of shooting a ton of threes, I I mean, I get it, uh, you know, in some ways, but they got to do a better job defending. That That's where they're losing these games. And it's clearly impacting them on the offensive end. When yeah. they don't hit shots and guys are struggling, it's really affecting the way that they defend. We, we've seen it so many times. You certainly saw it against New Orleans where they weren't even in that game. It was surprising how poor they were. And you could tell that Jock Fawn's getting frustrated because Jock Fawn after that game, Really went after the team. Last night, I knew that he was going to be soft on them afterwards because it doesn't make any sense to beat up a team two games in a row. Then the message is going to get lost. And they did play better in that in that first half. But look what happened in the third quarter. The 22-4 to four run, which changed the game. Number one, the Nets only had one field goal during that. It was like five-and-a-half-minute stretch. And look at all the threes that they were giving up during that stretch. And, and a lot of them were wide open. There were three in a row that uh, – the Houston Rockets hit. How many times have you seen a, an opposing team shoot a three and say, "Wow, that was a that was a tough shot. That that was contested well by the Nets." It's not, I always feel like guys are taking wide open threes. Yeah, and and that's Jock Vaughn spoke about that early in the season, and he's gone as far as admitting that it was part of the strategy of them trying to give up some above the break threes. And really, what that is is them being in that drop coverage, trying to give up above the break threes, which are still you know, analytically the worst shot in the NBA and trying to do that with guys yeah. in position to rebound and in turn, more defensive rebounds, more opportunities to run. But during this stretch, you know, those two ends of the floor, offense and defense are correlated, they're linked, and they haven't been able to get going on either and break out any struggles. And you said, you know, you're talking about them stinking on defense. Over those last 12 games, they're allowing the third highest effective field goal percentage in the league. So they're not stopping anybody. And as I said, that's neutralizing their transition game, which is where they were trying to create a lot of those three-point opportunities. I have the numbers here. Over their first 23 games, they were sixth in fast break points, eighth in opponents' fast break points. Over these last 12 games, they're 26th in fast break yeah. points and 27th in opponents' fast break points. So, like, the more they start to struggle on defense, their offense can't get going. Then their and, and, defense is bad. Yeah. It's like, it's just, and then, you know, like, you talk, you were talking about how often Houston hitting three threes in a row and all that stuff. Houston was a plus 18 at the three-point line last night. They made six yeah. threes. That's the difference in the game. You know, the Nets are trying to be a three-point shooting team, and I think they've been hit with some bad luck in terms of, Certain teams having guys hit threes who normally don't. They're not making things difficult on any teams either. Uh, though. Guys are wide how, about the, how about the Sacramento game? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that, was, that was, was a whole, that was a, a different level. But yeah. yeah. Well, and I also think, but I, I also think, Eric, when you look at, so they go into the season, and I can't believe that Sean Marks or Jock Vaughn thought it would work out perfectly, but maybe there was, they were optimistic that Ben Simmons will be healthy. And he, we could play him 25 minutes a night. And let's say, I'll throw it a, a crazy number, that he was going to play 65 games this year. Think about how much better he's going to make you defensively. So he should be one of your better players. He, he's he been an all-defensive player in the league. He's a guy that can guard multiple positions. There have been times where he's had a bit of a nasty streak in him when he's defended guys. He kind of takes on that challenge. So you remove that from the equation, and let's face it, you cannot sit here and tell me, oh, well, when he comes back, things will be different. You have no idea if he's coming back. In fact, if you were a betting man, which I'm not, you'd probably bet that he's not going to play again this season. So that's kind of the you know conundrum that the Nets are facing. They're they're stuck right now as a team that's five games under 500, and you know their most accomplished player doesn't play. Their young star 
you know, he's struggling right now. He could certainly snap out of it. And then a, a guy that I'm talking about, Mikel Bridges, and then obviously a guy like Cam Thomas are hoping for more growth out of him. It's it's they're in a really, really rough place right now. And I, I knew that this conversation and, you know, talk about defense and how that impacts transition, how that impacts three point shooting. It's all the areas that Ben Simmons in a perfect world is supposed to help them. So I knew that the conversation was going to lead here. And, you know, there's a lot of people that, as I just said, Ben Simmons, the Nets can't guard anybody at the point of attack right now because Thomas and Dimwitty aren't good there. Mikhail Bridges, frankly, hasn't been good either. They can't get stops. They can't push the ball and facilitate in the half court. They're having trouble finding a guy next to play to play next to Cam Thomas. All these things are things that Ben Simmons has done. And people say, you know, well, when Ben Simmons gets back, you know, the Nets miss Ben Simmons, they need him. And it's like, this is a, we're going on a three year sample size of Ben Simmons not playing basketball games. He's played yep. 54 games over the last three seasons. And that, and then it gets into a conversation of, like you said, if the Nets were actually expecting him to play for an extended period, which it seems like they were because they were crafting this identity of pushing the ball, playing in transition, doing all these things, making him the point guard of their offense. What does that say about them and their decision making prospect? If they were banking heavily on this guy to be available. Because, you know, we heard we got the media tour from Ben Simmons's camp over the summer of, you know, I'm feeling the best I have. I want to be an all star. I want to dominate people. Yep. My body is the strongest it's been since being into Brooklyn. Never going to knock a guy for being injured. But it took six games for Ben Simmons to be off the floor. He's been gone for two months now. So, yeah. so entering this season, did you have, you know, how did you feel about that? And did you buy into any of that hype that he would be a player the Nets would be able to lean on? Yeah, well, I was really discouraged when you saw all that stuff on Instagram. I, I don't want to see any of that stuff. You, you've you been in the league for too many years. I don't care what you look like in the summer. First of all, and I, I can't believe the fans buy into this stuff. Their job is to work out and try to get better every summer during the offseason. That's their job. You don't get extra credit for that. So why else would you be tweeting that stuff out or putting it on Instagram? You know, um, when I went to, I was in Milwaukee, I think it was three years ago for training camp and somehow uh, Kobe Bryant's name uh, came up and, uh, you know, Giannis started uh, talking about him and I had told him a story, which Kobe was the one who had told me the story. Giannis wasn't the one that told me. Kobe said that one summer Giannis flew out to LA to work with them. They spent like, you know, one or two days and he said that Giannis was writing stuff. They'd do a drill together. Giannis would write stuff down. He had a notebook with him, Right. Giannis wasn't putting that stuff on Instagram. He wasn't doing it. So people would say, well, look at Giannis. He's working out and he's got the Mamba mentality, whatever other nonsense that the players sometimes do. To me, that was discouraging that a player like Ben Simmons, we know that you can work out. We know that you look great with your shirt off. You'll have 82 games to prove that you're ready to play. And what was the number you just gave? Six games is all that he's played this year. That's why I don't even care about the update. Like uh, we always joke about on the radio show, it's always, He's ramping up for on-court activities. He's doing one-on-one, two-on-two, three-on-three. They always skip four-on-four. Four. They go right to five-on-five. Five, and then what happens? Setback. So I, I don't care about, like, to me, there's no update. When is he going to be available to play? I don't care what he's doing behind the scenes and who he's working with. None of that stuff matters because it's so frustrating at this point. And you tell me, you honestly think that Jacques Vaughn is sitting there counting days until we get Ben Simmons back? And I want him to play. And I'm not saying that he's not hurt. But, at, you know, there reaches a point where you're either playing or you're not playing. Let's face it. Ever since he's been in Brooklyn, he's not playing. Yeah, and he, Simmons talked to the – the Nets have been doing this thing where he's been out for two months, but we get an update every two weeks. So every two <laughs> weeks, it's like hey, – hey, we get to two weeks, and it's like he's trying to get better. We'll talk to you in two more weeks. And it's like, all right, that just – I mean, the reporting of the Simmons injury was just ridiculous to me at a certain point because first – he was out with a hip, uh, hip soreness, yeah. a hip impingement. And then he's, you know, out three, four, five, six games. Then his agent, Bernie Lee comes and leaks to Brian Lewis of the New York post that it's a nerve impingement in his back, which is the same injury that shut him down at the all-star break last season. Yeah. But despite that, the agent says it's nothing similar to what he went through last season. And right when that happened, I'm like, well, wait a minute. It's the same injury. What do you mean? Yeah. It's nothing similar. And then yeah, he says, nothing similar. It's supposed to be a short-term issue. We're two months now, and we have no idea when the guy's going to play again. So it's like, it's in a, in a perfect world, Ben Simmons is an effective player. In the first six games of the season, we saw it. He could help the Nets in a lot of areas that they need. He fits well with what they'd be trying to do. But I think that says a little bit more 
about the Nets trying to cultivate a little bit of an identity around what Ben Simmons can do for a guy who hadn't been able to stay on the floor for two seasons prior to this. Yeah, and I think yeah, it, it all goes back to, would you have made that trade all the way back? Uh, you know, How many years ago was it now? Two years ago. Two years or would ago. you have told James Harden, suck it up, wait for Kevin Durant to come back, and then we're going to make a run in the second half of the season? Because, you know, it that gets that that's that's interesting. That one, it never made it never seemed to make any sense. The, a lot the trade of people have, they made it. Yeah, a lot of people have floated that. And the Nets were yeah, they were in a position where that that team was that team was going nowhere, in my opinion. I mean, there were you talk to people who are in and around that locker room and they say that they've experienced few things like what that locker room was like <laughs> on a daily basis that season, just in terms of mood. And well, were, you didn't have to trade them in Philadelphia. Well, well, where else were they going to trade him though? Because uh, he, he, he had a, he's on. This is how it goes in the NBA now. He's like he had a he had a one team list. He's on his contract's about to expire. He's Joe Cronin like, of the Portland Trailblazers didn't uh, listen to that. He traded he traded yeah, Dame Lillard the, to the Milwaukee. Difference, the, the difference there is that Damian Lillard had three or four years left on his contract. James Harden was an expiring contract, so the Bucks could trade for Damian Lillard and say, "Hey, you're here. You know, you're either going to play here or not." If they trade him to the if they trade him to the Clippers, Harden would have been upset. What if they had trade him to Miami? There were there were moves they could have made. Well, I sometimes I sometimes think you got to you got to call the players on this stuff. No, I, I, I mean I I agree. It, it's just it's a it's a question of what would those teams have been willing to give up. I get it. I get it. You know, I get it. The Nets still got they got two first round picks for right. for him. So it gets into an interesting conversation, and you know it's it's an argument of are those two first round picks even worth them having to have Ben Simmons contract for all this time, which I, yeah. you know, that, that gets into a real, I, and you, and you probably thought what I thought, maybe the Nets thought that he just needs to get out of Philadelphia because of what happened in the playoff series against Atlanta. Maybe the change of scenery would do him good playing with the Nets. You get to play with great players. Like I remember when they made the trade, I said, he's never going to play with a guy that's as good as Kevin Durant. It's, mm-hmm. it's just never going to happen. And he really never played with them, which is really disappointing. Yeah, well, but and then the other thing that it becomes is they traded for Simmons, and now you know with them it was the mental health stuff, and he didn't want to play in Philadelphia because Doc threw him yep. under the bus and Joel and whatever. But now he comes to the Nets, and there's still some of that initially. But now it's at his back isn't right, and he has to have surgery on a bulging disc, and now he has all this, and it's like how much of this was known when the trade was made, and that's you know, I wasn't on the beat full time two years ago when that was going on, but that's just an interesting conversation because they traded for a guy who now he can't stay on the floor, like for any extended period of time. And, you know, it's, it's just really unfortunate, but you just brought up KD Kyrie. I think it's a good way to round out the episode because you're a guy who's obviously been, you know, on the calls for a while and the Nets have undergone a past three years, unlike many other teams have in NBA history. When you just reflect back on where this team is now in comparison to where they were when they made that clean sweep, what just stands out to you most about those three or four years that they were really trying to push into that title conversation? Well, well, you know, when you do sign a guy that's you know is probably going to miss the first year with an Achilles injury, you know, it's a risk. So, and I think to me, the the biggest things were injury, illness, absence. If that seemed to define, you know, the the three of them. It was including Harden in, in the group as well. But, you know, Kyrie, I always say with Kyrie, it's always something. And I'm not blaming him or taking a position on the vaccination or not the vaccination, but it's always something with Kyrie, and the always something leads to him not playing games. So Kyrie was constantly in and out of the lineup. Then you had Kevin Durant, who was hurt a lot. But when push came to shove, and a few years ago, and they beat a good Boston team in five games, they smoked Milwaukee in games one and two, and then obviously James Harden got hurt in game two, and that's when it all started to fall apart. The second half of game three, was it game three or game four where Kyrie got hurt in Milwaukee? Game three. It, it was game, all right, and that's, you know, and Durant, I was, I, I was and Durant still three. nearly won the series, and they yeah. would have beaten Atlanta. That Here's the thing with sports. Just because you have, you came just this close one year doesn't mean you're going to get back to that. That was the next year, and they got incredibly lucky, unlucky. So I get it. People will look back and say, oh, it was a disaster. Yet it was injuries that stood in their way. It wasn't any locker room strife or Kyrie going off the deep end during the playoffs. He got legitimately hurt. James Harden got legitimately hurt. If those guys could have been healthy, which is the big if, I think they would have won the championship that year. 
They were just incredibly unlucky. I was at game two, and I think they were beating – I don't remember the exact number. They were up by, I think, 40 or 50 points in game two. nuts. Center. And how good, how good was Kevin Durant? How good was Kevin Durant in game seven when they just cut out the middleman and they just let him bring the ball up, let mm-hmm. him make plays, and they, could, they couldn't stop the guy. The biggest yeah. shot of that series was Durant at the rim gets blocked by Brook Lopez. The ball gets kicked out, eventually ends up in Joe Harris's hands. This is an overtime. Wide open Joe Harris that. hits that shot. I think it makes it a four-point game, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, or maybe a five-point game. He missed yeah. that three. I think it was Giannis went down and scored, then Middleton went down and scored, and then they ended up winning the game. But if Joe Harris had made that three, the Nets would have won game seven. I, uh, and I, I hate to I hate to bag on Joe Harris, who I really like as a guy, but he also had a shot in game three with around 30 or 40 seconds left when they were up by – they were either up by one or two, and it would have made it maybe a two-possession game. He was yeah. wide open at the right elbow, and he missed a wide-open shot there, and that would have ended it. They were, yeah. they were up – people forget that. In game three, after Kyrie got hurt, with like a minute and 10 left, they were up by four points in that game, and they were really in a position to win that game. And then if they win that game – this is what's so interesting about sports. If they win that game where KD's foot's not on the line in game seven, or if Joe Harris hits that shot, Budenholzer's fired. Giannis, all the questions are still about him. Never yeah. the title. Where are the Bucks right now? It's like people talk about that series. The ripple effects of that series across the NBA are so interesting to think about because the discourse, maybe Giannis wins one after that. That wouldn't be surprising. But what does that do to the Bucks? Does he win it in Milwaukee? Yeah. Does he go to another team? You know, it's just unbelievable. And you talk about that Nets team. Zach Lowe talked about it with Ian Eagle and Noah Eagle on his podcast a few weeks back. And they, you know, they demolished the Celtics in the first round of those playoffs. You talk to people within the Celtics organization when that happened, and they were like legitimately shook. Like, we don't know how we're going to compete with this team in the coming seasons. And then, you know, less than a year later, it's all gone. So it's. Yeah. And, And the Celtics swept the Nets. Yeah. That's the amazing thing. Exactly. That's the amazing unbelievable. Thing. Well, uh, that, that about does it. Appreciate you carving some time out of your busy schedule to come hop on this podcast and talk about the dysfunction before and I guess currently of the Brooklyn Nets. Really appreciate it, man. All right, Eric. Thanks a lot. That does it for this episode of Believe in Nets on the Believe Podcast Network, your one-stop shop for everything happening across the sports and entertainment world. Hope you guys enjoyed the interview with Frank. I am Eric Slater, Brooklyn Nets beat reporter for ClutchPoints.com. Make sure you guys subscribe to Believe in Nets on all streaming platforms, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Leave a five-star review. doesn't cost you anything. and really means a lot to me if you enjoy the product. Going to have more Nets basketball coming up over these next few weeks before they actually go to Paris. We're going to have a little bit of a break there, but may present an opportunity for them to snap out of this rut. But the Nets are coming home. They got games against the Oklahoma City Thunder and Portland Trailblazers this weekend. We'll see if they can snap out of this rut, and I'll have more reporting on it soon.